other motivations for wearing the niqab. Although religious reasons predominated, the nine women interviewed gave a number of supplementary explanations for why they had chosen to wear the niqab. For one interviewee, Aisha, while wearing the niqab was partly about religious conviction, she did identify an outward meaning or message to those who might observe her. I feel like for me these days, it's more just like an identity thing. I'm not just doing it for God, even though that is partly my intention. Mostly my intention is just to show that even as a niqabi, I can do the same thing as you, right? Because the only people putting the barrier on my capabilities are people who don't fully understand niqab. I don't put these barriers on me. I don't feel like Muslim women should shy away from their identity or the how they want to dress just because other people don't understand. Aisha appeared willing to acknowledge that her reasons for wearing the niqab might shift or fluctuate depending on the context. Religious motivations while present were not the primary instigating force as her use of the term these days suggests. Aisha was aware that the niqab functioned as a powerful marker of identity, and she was keen to create an image that dispelled typical notions of the niqab wearer as conservative and reserved. Other supplementary explanations offered for wearing the niqab include that it helped me become a better person, to which Marine referred in part to appropriate social interactions between men and women. Not only did the niqab remind her about suitable relations between the sexes, but she noticed that it seemed to signal men to treat her with more respect, which she appreciated. Canadian women in Clark's study commented that the niqab freed them from the confines of fashion and having to waste hours perfecting their hair or applying makeup. Zakia commented that she felt more protected when she wore the niqab, though she didn't directly discuss avoiding unwelcome male attention, she alluded to feeling more free in her movements when she wore the niqab. Some women in Denmark felt that wearing the niqab lived up to an ideal of Muslim female behavior, which included hiding one's beauty to male outsiders and avoiding problematic, sexually charged attention. Interestingly, in Belgium, several women rejected harassment by men as a motive for wearing the niqab, stating they got touched more and that it excites the imagination of some people. Canadian interviewee Aisha declared, women in niqab get raped too, you know. It has nothing to do with the way people dress. Although the niqab is often linked with extreme political views, niqab wearing women in Denmark disassociated with such linkages. For example, one woman stated, we do not do it for political reasons. I cannot be bothered to single out myself every day in a society that is predominantly non-Muslim so I can make a political statement. That's really not going to motivate me for too long. By contrast, Canadian niqab wearer Aima Wariach has stated, I wear niqab as an act of defiance against the patriarchy that keeps telling me what to wear because somehow they know what it means to be liberated from Taliban-like oppression. While there may be exceptions among women for whom other factors overshadow the religious motivation for wearing the niqab, and perhaps only temporarily, it is difficult to reduce the niqab to these supplementary explanations. A plethora of factors may play a role in the initial decision or provide a partial explanation for adopting the niqab. However, a spiritual quest or pursuit of piety appears to motivate most women to keep the niqab on for long periods of time. Some scholars have framed the wearing of the niqab primarily as a practice to cultivate piety and submission to God, rather than emphasizing its voluntary, individually chosen character structured by liberal sensibilities. While I was careful not to ascribe a political consciousness to the interviewees, as the section below describes, the women spoke in the language of individual choice, and I would be wary of the assertion that a sharp religious agency or consciousness is necessarily exclusive of the liberal matrix.
social consequences of wearing the niqab. People who do not wear the niqab will often speak of their subjective fear of the niqab, the threat it represents, and niqab-wearing women as potential perpetrators of crime. However, the interviews in Canada and Europe revealed that women who wear the niqab are frequently the targets of violent acts by others. Each of my nine interviewees revealed that they had been subjected at one point or another to abuse from members of the public while wearing their niqabs. In most cases, the abuse was verbal aggression or threats, but others also experienced being stared at with hostility, shoved, spat on, or elbowed. Some of the women described these negative experiences rather lightly, indicating that the perpetrator was not very, very educated or could not have known better. Others were clearly distressed by the daily experiences of anger and hostility toward them. Alia, who lives in Montreal, said the following about whether she experiences negative reactions to her dress. Yes, always, it's something every day. Stares, glares, comments, people mumbling while I walk by. I was called a terrorist. I've been told many times that it's not Halloween anymore. So all these things are something I face every day. But sometimes I feel like when it's just verbal, that's a good day. Like I've had a good day today because it was just verbal, it wasn't physical. Maria, who lives in Montreal, said that most of her experiences with the public while wearing her niqab are negative. One terrifying example she gave was of being pregnant and pushed on a bus while people watched. Mehreen, Zakia, and Anjum, who live in Ontario, all had negative encounters with people at some point, but they tended to diminish these experiences, suggesting they were more anomalous than the norm. Clark's study of Canadian women also indicated that positive experiences or optimistic assessments predominated. However, an exception to this trend was when political tensions flared up as a result of terrorist activity such as 9-11, or when the niqab became a flashpoint in political debates. Then niqab-wearing women experienced heightened aggression. In one such instance during a federal election in Canada, Zakia described vicious attacks that she received in her inbox through Facebook. It was hurtful for me when I had so many negative remarks, and then a couple of them were quite threatening. You should leave the country. I was quite upset and concerned about my security. While the interviewees in Quebec tended to have more negative experiences than those in Ontario, this may simply reflect the fact that there have been more niqab controversies in Quebec, including the several attempts at banning the niqab and the eventual enactment of a functional niqab ban than in the rest of Canada. Reports of harassment, vandalism, hate crimes and insults against Muslims multiplied in the months after one such attempted ban, Bill 60, was introduced. Ordinary people are emboldened by the government's backing of exclusionary ideas, and they act as vigilantes, taking it upon themselves to enforce the law upon Muslim women. Contributors to Society Given that many people make negative and often contradictory assumptions about niqab-wearing women as unassertive, silent, unsociable, unexpressive, boring, and unwilling to integrate into society, while also finding them aggressive, radical, and untrustworthy, I specifically asked each of my nine interviewees about these assumptions and how they see their role in Canadian society. Wahida responded to people's mis preconceptions. I am an individual. I have my personality. I have a big and strong personality. It's not because I cover my face that I am nothing. It's not true. And they cannot imagine. At this moment, my hair is purple. I have piercings. Last week, my hair was pink, you know, but they don't imagine that I'm a complex person like everyone. Aisha made a point of telling me, though I did not ask, about her beliefs with respect to homosexuality. You can be gay and Muslim. 
Not that I'm saying I'm gay and Muslim, I'm just saying that there are Muslims that are LGBTQ, and that even at the Prophet's time, there were companions who were transgender. She went on to say, I feel like every human deserves respect, regardless of how they dress, who they love, or what the color of their skin is. So I feel like my existence will show people that I have dignity. They will see me as a person with dignity, as a human, just the way I am. Thus the conflation of necessarily conservative beliefs with niqab wearing women would be a mistake. Each of the nine interviewees communicated regularly with other people, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, contrary to, to the pervasive perception that they wished to withdraw from society. They gave multiple examples of friendships, neighborly encounters, interactions with teachers, professors, peers and service providers, and indeed anyone of any gender they might encounter in their daily lives. None of the interviewees expressed any difficulty in such interactions, except to note that sometimes others were surprised that they could speak or were willing to initiate a conversation.